Welcome to the Real Estate Masters Podcast, where we interview the top names in the real estate game. If you want to grow your real estate business, see more podcasts, or get free resources, go to www.remcommunity.com, the only podcast that allows you to directly connect with the guests in many of the highest level names in the real estate game. You are in for a treat with our next guest. Do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, and don't forget to go to remcommunity.com to connect with some of the highest level real estate professionals in the United States through our community and through our high level masterminds. Let's go. All right, welcome. We have Mr. Rich Fetke with us today. Rich is a real estate veteran. He's got one of the top podcasts uh, out there. He is an uh, ex-gamer, which I'd love to hear more about. Uh, just a phenomenal guy. Met him a few years ago, and I'm really excited to have him on the show because he's got a lot of experience and a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of followers and a lot of traction in this space. So, welcome, Rich. How you doing today, buddy? Good. Really good to be here. Yeah, Great man. Thanks you, for man. coming on. So, tell me what's going on in your world. So, you're. I I was reading your bio. I've known you for I think a couple years now, but I didn't realize you were an ex gamer. Uh, so you, you know, any, anybody who does extreme sports, I have so much respect for because there's so much training and so much uh, you put on the line for that. So I guess we'll start there. Just tell me a little bit about your, your background on, on, uh, on the X Games and we'll get into real estate. So I'd like to hear a little bit more okay, about that sure. and yeah, how, you, go how you got into That's that. Funny. Yeah, I mean, I got, I got into adventure sports when I was in my teens uh, in snow skiing with my younger brother. He's four years younger than I am. And we just started to um, there was the blizzard of 1978 when we grew up in Boston and we started to find these roofs, like three stories, some buildings, and we'd jump off the roofs into snow banks and realize that we could go bigger and bigger and bigger. So that we carried over to skiing and we started to go bigger and bigger on ski jumps. And that kind of got the adrenaline addiction started. And then, so after that, then we, um, then we moved into bungee jumping and, uh, uh, skydiving, uh, slack lining, high lining, things like that. So it was just kind of like that, that passion of like feeling the rush, taking something on that's a big challenge, learning how to manage and deal with fear, how to stay focused in the moment. Uh, the X Games was the first X Games ever in Providence, Rhode Island in 1995. Mm -hmm. And um, we had done a lot of pretty insane bungee jumps and they had seen some video of that, ESPN did. And they came part of one of the events there was bungee jumping. So it's like a high diving competition, a 160 foot crane in the sky over Providence over a little reflecting pool. And it was all judged on just like a high diving competition. How many flips can you do? What the type of technique form? How many flips can you do on the rebound and all that? So it was cool just, you know, competing with people from all around the world, all these different countries and meeting different people and just a really cool experience. So that was my X Games. Uh, they, they had bungee jumping the first two years of the X Games. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. So you seem like one of those that, you know, you said an, an adrenaline junkie and anybody who does high level stuff in real estate like you do uh, is typically pretty competitive. So it seems like you've taken your, like what you did in the X Games and the com competitiveness and making things bigger and better and that type of thing and, and took it into business. So let's transition into that. So you, you run a podcast, you run a, uh, a network of real estate investors. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, how you got into that and um, how you help people on that, that side of the business. Sure. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, before that, I'll go roll, roll back a little bit. We kind of created our whole business out of desperation. And the reason I say that is um, I had, when I moved uh, in 95, I moved from Boston to California and I became a certified uh, business coach, a master certified business coach, went through that training, uh, had a, already had a business degree, had sold my health club that I ran in Boston area. Um, I had sold that, moved to California. And so for years, I was uh, working with clients as a professional coach and a business coach. And then I uh, landed a book deal with Simon Schuster and read a book, uh, wrote a book called Extreme Success. So it was taking those extreme sports um, lessons and carrying them over into business and life. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, how to deal with fear, how to stay focused, how to be in the moment, um, some of these, how to be more effective, how to struggle less. And so that was great. Everything, I was like on top of the world. I was giving keynote speeches. I was traveling all over the world. I was on all these ma major media outlets. And then I noticed this, 
um, freckle. I mean, I have, I have freckles, but this was a weird freckle that on my leg that was getting bigger. And I went in and was diagnosed with, um, with melanoma, which is the most threatening form of skin cancer, which, you know, it's not that bad if you can get removed and everything, but they, they removed the melanoma, but then they had me do some scans to make sure that hadn't spread. And they saw, they saw four masses on my liver. And so after multiple tests over several weeks, uh, an oncologist said, it looks like it's spread to your liver mm. and um, you're probably gonna have about six months to live. Oh, wow. It really rocked my world. We I'll had imagine. a seven-year-old daughter, a three-year-old daughter. Um, it just, yeah, and being told that you have six months to live with little kids like that, it's, oh man, I remember I was bouncing on the trampoline with our, with our little three-year-old one day and giggling and laughing and falling on top of each other. And I just broke down in tears when I realized that I wasn't gonna see her get married or grow up or see my grandkids and all. And um, so in that desperation, Kathy, my wife, who is a stay-at-home mom at the time, um, she's like, what am I gonna do for income? And she had this small radio show in the Bay Area uh, where she interviewed people on different areas of um, personal growth and everything from relationships to health and fitness to finance. And so she's like, I, I got to do something here for an income source. And she actually had someone on her show that was a real estate investor. And as she spoke to him, she just got all fired up and she came home and she said, this is what, this is what I can do. This is what we can do uh, in case you don't make it. And so she dove in head first and started to have guests on her uh, radio show on a regular AM station on a regular basis and started to learn everything she could about real estate. And so we started to invest in real estate, bought a bunch of properties in, in Dallas, Texas, north of Dallas, and started to learn how that worked and how we could create cash flow. And that's kind of what got us you know, into real estate. And luckily, after several more tests, I got uh, scheduled for a PET scan, which is the most advanced for, uh, scan for seeing if someone has cancer. And it came back that I was cancer free. So it was, um, it was just, it was such a trippy time. What it was, was uh, clusters of blood vessels that were in my liver that they, they told me that like 20% of the population has these hemangiomas, they're called, they're clusters of blood vessels that group up and um, on a CT scan or even on an ultras uh, ultrasound like they had me do, it shows up as masses just like cancer. Mm. Um, so anyway, here I am. It's, you know. So the false later. positive, basically. A false positive, yeah. That's okay, exactly just, just making that clear. Because I, I, I got goosebumps when you said that because my sister, um, let's see, it's been 13 years ago. She was only 30 years old and she was diagnosed with cancer and ended up spreading to her liver and she passed away. So oh, I'm sorry, man. when you said that, it was like, man, I just got chills just thinking about what, imagining just like what's going through your head and, and everything that, you know, pro you had to process, right? And I'm sure it's something that looking back was probably a blessing overall because it probably made you like understand how precious life is and, and not to take things for granted, right? So absolutely. Those are some of the lessons. There was so many lessons, you know, as a coach, I'd always been around helping people, you know, live life on their own terms to live a more balanced life and all that. And uh, so I, I tried to take my own advice as best I could. I had my own coach. So I was constantly not spending too much time at the office as they say we shouldn't do. I was constantly uh, giving attention to my family and taking care of myself and all that. So the cool thing when I thought I might be dying, I was like, wow, well, at least I've made the most. I've taken all the time I could with my family and my kids. Right. I didn't have regrets, basically. Um, but now on the other side of it, some of the lessons are nothing matters. <laughs> you know, and when we lose money in real estate or there's a challenge with an employee or anything, it's like, whatever, I'm, I'm alive, you know? <laughs> So yeah, I try and teach as much as possible too. I mean, so I've been in business 20 years now and for the first between 10 and 15 years, everything's stressed, well, not everything, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Like deals fall through contractors don't show up. I mean, you can get so stressed in this business, but when you step back and realize that first of all, like, like you said, like that stuff really doesn't matter that much. And what I've found is every time, if I look back at every tough moment in my life and things that happened, there was always something good that came out of it. You know, whether it was, you know, getting divorced and finding a new wife or contractor screws you over 
and then you hire another contractor that if that contractor wouldn't have screwed you up, you wouldn't have found because it wasn't the right, right time. <laughs> I mean, there's so many different things that come out of bad situations. You just have to look at them and, and, and find those, you know, silver linings. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was, so that was basically that, that was that desperation. It was like, that's what got us into real estate investing. And then um, as Kathy and I continued in real estate investing, we uh, started to have friends saying like, how do you do that? And could you help us out? We started to help them out. And then one day we were sitting at this little cafe up in Sacramento and Kathy's saying, you know, wouldn't it be great to kind of form a little group of investors where we can help each other, we can support them. All our friends are asking us how we're doing this. We should form something, put something together. And, and she's saying these things and she goes, but you know, because of a radio show and then she was starting to interview more people. And um, then when we launched a, a podcast on iTunes, all of a sudden more people started to come to us, you know, get more awareness. And so she's like, you know, I'm, I'm getting invited to speak at these local RIAs and they're so cheesy. They have these people coming in, they do the back of the room sales thing. And it's like, they're selling these outdated course. I wish we could just form a group of investors that were just real people giving them real information, help them get them into real investment properties and all that. And so I was jotting down on a little napkin and I wrote down real wealth network mm. and I turned it around and showed it to her and she said, that's it. And so that's, that's when we formed real wealth network uh, back in 2003, a long time ago. Very and cool. we thought we were going to have maybe a hundred, 200 investors and now uh, just found out yesterday that we just passed 50,000 members in our network. That's fantastic. Oh, really so tell, so tell us your model there. I know a little bit about it, but I'll let you kind of explain what you do for other investors. Sure. Yeah. So um, three main things that we do at Real Wealth. One is uh, we provide a ton of free education. So we've produced over 800 free educational webinars, um, uh, over 5 million downloads of the podcast, a lot of, a lot of education. Um, that's real that we don't charge a penny for to join the network. We don't charge anything for uh, our business model. The way it's monetized is we have property teams around the country with these real, what we call a real income property. It goes beyond turnkey. It's standards that there's a certain amount of time left on the roof and the appliances and, and how they're rehabbed and everything. Um, so the, there are these cash flowing turnkey properties with tenants in place. So we refer our investors to these different property teams around the country so they can acquire cash flowing single family, like one to four unit properties. That's a big part of our business. And then the other side of the business is we also syndicate and work with developers uh, on doing syndication deals for group investments. So people can come in and invest in the group investment and we'll acquire uh, mostly residential development is our main focus. And so that's been, that's been really cool too. Yeah, that's cool. So you told me a story. I'm not going to tell too much of the story because I don't know if you want me to disclose this, but you told me a story um, a year, year and a half ago when we uh, were in, were in um, where were we for the strategic coach event Santa and Monica. you had something with investors that didn't go quite right. And then later down the road, there's something happened where you ended up taking care of those investors. And that story like really resonated with me because that's something you didn't have to do. Um, and you felt inclined to do that. And when I, when you told me that story, I'm like, this is the real deal. This guy like really takes care of his people because there are a lot of people, as you know, in this industry that just want to make a dollar and that don't really, um, I don't want to say don't care about their investors, but would rather benefit themselves over investors. So when you told me that story, I'm like, man, Rich is the real deal. Like he takes care <laughs> of his people. So, uh, I just wanted to kind of share that and tell you that I totally respect you because. I mean, what you did was a big deal. I mean, again, I'm not going to disclose the details, but what you did, like you put a lot of your own money out there to take care of people. And so I really respect you for that. That was that awesome. Was really That's cool. uh, it's awesome yeah. that you remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It just, you know, not in real estate, not everything goes the way you think it's going to go. You know, you usually do your due diligence and all that. And you come at it the right way. And usually it works and it's very profitable and it can be amazing. And sometimes things shift and change and, the market changes. I mean, even what, you know, what's gone on in, in this year, you know, it's crazy. So, um, so there's something there around when things don't go right, looking at how can we take, I think that's what we do. So it's like, how can we take responsibility here instead of pointing fingers and saying, well, it's because of the markets because of that, but it's like, what can we do for our investors? And yeah, it's just an integrity piece for us. And, and, you know, it's not just me, it's my wife, Kathy, we're co-CEOs of Real Wealth. Um, so it's just the core values that we hold. So we just, 
want to take care of our investors and it and it always works out you know it's a karma thing too it always no works doubt. out in the end no doubt if it hasn't already come back to you i'm sure that it absolutely will so that's that's yeah. good stuff oh, i think it has uh tenfold you know <laughs> Good. Yeah. I mean, just feeling good too, right? I mean, just the, the feeling that you have of taking care of them and that helps you to run the business better. And, and I'm sure it, if, you're, if your staff knew what you did, which I don't know if they did or not, I'm sure that instills more values of them of like, man, we need to do right as well. So looking yeah, at the I'm, leader of, of the organization, you know, you are the person that they look up to. So if they see stuff like that, that's going to resonate with the whole organization and come back many times. Nice, man. Yeah, we're very transparent with our team. We have 27 employees and we're very transparent. We share everything with them. Um, yeah, I mean, we even have a profit sharing plan with everyone on our team. It's like the better the company does, the better everyone does. Um, you know, we just try to operate through that conscious capitalism principles, you know? Super cool, super cool. So you, you've mentioned a couple of times and I, and I saw on your, on your bio talking about focus and you... Um, you talk about focused investor. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about that. So obviously with the X games, you have to be focused with business. You have to be focused. Like tell us where that came from and how you, uh, how you stay focused with, you know, 27 employees and 50,000 members and podcasts and all the stuff that you've got going on. Yeah. So what I mentioned then when we we're talking about that was uh, the focused investor is a program that I put together. And like, you know, remember I was saying I was a keynote speaker and a business coach. So I carried that over to real wealth. And after running the, the, the business for a few years, uh, we were doing live events to do live events every month. And we were in the Bay Area. And so Kathy said, hey, to kick off the year, it would be really cool if you could come in and speak to our, the network around uh, how to be more focused, how to be a, a, you know, grow yourself and improve, how to be a, a better investor, really kind of carrying these same tools over. Um, so I did this program called the focus investor back then. And now every year I've done it. So this last year was, I think the 15th, 14th or 15th year wow. in a row of delivering this program that I super get into. So I research it all year and I look at what are the latest things as far as what we're developed and learned about the human brain, about human effectiveness and about focus, where when I was growing up, I was diagnosed hyperkinetic. Uh, when I was eight years old, which today they'd be ADHD and wow. I did lousy in school. I didn't even graduate with my high school class. I had to go back and go to summer school. And so I had this belief that I was stupid. Um, but what I really didn't realize was I just had a hard time focusing. So I've really made it part of my life. Life's work is to learn how to be more effective and how to focus. And that's what I've been sharing with the members of Real Wealth and you know, when I would deliver keynote speeches and everything. So the focus investor is just things that we can do as investors, how we can be more effective, how we can become the best version of ourselves, uh, everything from how to structure our days to our months, to our quarters, to our years. Uh, actually, a lot of things, you know, you and I met in Strategic Coach, since a lot of the things that we learned in the Strategic Coach program about how to be more effective as an entrepreneur, it's a very similar type of thing is how to be more effective as, a, as an investor. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing about business is people think that it's about mechanics, right? It's, it's not necessarily what marketing strategy is the best. It's not like all those things are great, but what it comes down to, in my opinion, is you need to work on yourself first. And when you work on yourself first in your focus, you can make better decisions, get in front of the right people, implement the strategies better. So, I mean, it sounds like you are doing a lot of what um, I like to talk about and what the high performers that I've, uh, that I've studied talk about is really just working on yourself, making sure you're focused, planning, planning your days out, making sure that you're, because, you know, in, in this game, you can get super unfocused. You can chase so many shiny objects. I'm sure you've seen that, oh, you know, huge, dealing yeah. with all kinds of, of people. So, what keeps you from chasing the shiny objects? I mean, or have you done that? Like, tell, tell us a little bit about that. And, and um, you know, I'm, I do it less than my wife, Kathy. Kathy's very much a visionary. Uh, I'm very much kind of the integrator of the company. I help create the systems and the structures. And I, um, I'm more of the, the coach for our leadership team. We have you know, five directors at Real Well, so I work with them. Kathy's very much the, that visionary who is always coming up with, you know, 20 new ideas a week, you know, and, and so I, I'm there to, to meet with her. We just met before this, you know, and just, you know, went over and we had a, our weekly, what we call our same page meeting, uh, just to find out like, what, what's your vision, Kathy? Where, where do you see us going? What's next? And then it's my job to kind of sort through that and be like, okay, so 
of these 20 ideas, let's narrow it down. It seems like these might be the two most important for us to take action on as, you know, as I ask your questions. So I think that's part of it. It's um, having someone that your question was how, how to stay focused and avoid this shiny objects. I think it's uh, whether it, it's you or whether it's someone in your life that you have to help support and draw out from you, what is most important to focus on? Because yeah, you're right. We'll just, we'll jump around and bounce around. Uh, for me, I use what I call, in, in that focused investor program, one of the things I share, I call the rule of three. And it's having three, made, no more than three major goals for your year, no more than three major goals for, uh, that you wrap into your quarter, uh, your month, your week, and your day. So I start, I start every day with what are those three most important things to focus on that are going to bring me uh, the results for this week, the three most important things for the week, this month, this quarter, and then the year. And so that, that's what helps me stay focused. And we do the same thing with our leadership team. We get together every quarter and say, okay, what are your three big, most important goals for your department uh, for this quarter? And, and based on what are, what are the big three for your year? So that way, like when things come up during the quarter, it's so easy to be like, oh, this is a new thing I could go after, a new goal. And people drop that old goal and go after the new one. So by really clarifying it and, you know, kind of carving it in stone, putting it in writing, saying these are my big three for the quarter, it, it helps us focus. And then if someone's like, they come to a meeting, a weekly meeting and say, you know what, I know this was the goal I set for this quarter and the year, but I think I want to change that. Then there's a discussion around it. And we really take a look at, is it, is it warranted? Should that be changed? Or it's like, no, let's carry that, that new goal over to next quarter because what we decided on was best for this quarter. Yeah, that's interesting, that top three. I implemented that about a year ago, and I do that uh, mostly for every day because I can get super like off into the weeds in other places. So uh, what I do is I'll take <laughs> three for the day, and I'll concentrate for the first two hours of every day getting those accomplished, You know, whether it's raising money for a deal or um, implementing a marketing strategy, like something that I know is high level that will produce results. Because really, if you look at your list of things you have to do, you have 20, 30, 40 things to do sometimes. But usually there's three top things on your list that if you did those and hyper-focused on them, the others really don't matter that much. So 100%, 100%, yeah. And yeah. you know, I'm actually the opposite. So I'm actually the visionary. My wife is more of a, she's not necessarily an integrator, but she's more of like, okay, you, Tony, you're taking on too much. You need to like tone it down a little bit. So, Great to have that. It's really oh, you have, you have to have that for sure. And that's one thing it took me a long time to do is to find an integrator. So for the first 10 years of my business, I was the visionary, I was the integrator. And then I just had a bunch of, you know, people running around doing stuff. And then uh, 10 years ago, I hired my sister and she is my integrator. Like when I've got oh, something, I, I just awesome. send it to her. She gets it done. I don't have to worry about it. So if you are a visionary, which a lot of entrepreneurs are, you need to have that integrator balance to where they can take the ideas that you have and either implement them or tell you that they're not great ideas right now. And you need to focus on. Absolutely. Uh, There's priorities. a great book called rocket fuel. I mm -hmm. highly recommended that rocket fuel. And it's all about that visionary integrator relationship. And it, it really helped me understand the visionary role and where Kathy's coming from uh, and how it can be super helpful and how it can be super dangerous that, you know, that approach. And it helped her understand my integrator role a lot more. She read it too, um, because a lot of times visionaries look at integ uh, integrators as you're slowing me down. I have this idea, and you you want to just you want to analyze it. You want to slow it down. You want to put some structures in place and everything. I don't want to. I just want to get it done. Mm -hmm. So it's like she better understands now. Oh, I see the need for that. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. So a uh, question I asked everybody: If you had um, Actually, I'll ask it a little bit differently this time. If someone had $10,000 sitting on the side and they had to invest it in something, what would you recommend them investing that $10,000 in? 10000 I would, I would kind of invest it and spread it across, across a couple things. Not, not like, I mean, it's $10,000, not that much as far as they can't do much with real estate or anything. So I would invest it into becoming the best version of myself. And what I mean by that is I would invest it in my education. So I would get, um, I wouldn't sign up for a $10,000 expensive program with one company. 
you know, <laughs> that would be just, you know, making all the promises and everything. I would probably use part of that to hire a coach to hold me accountable and help draw the answers out of me, a really good coach, mm -hmm. not a, not a consultant who's going to tell me what to do uh, and not a, um, not more of a, not a mentor, but a, a coach who could really draw out from me what action I need to take on a regular basis. So I'd meet with that coach every week. So I would invest it into that. I would invest it into several great, great books or programs. Um, and so that'd be the main thing. I would, I would invest it into me, into getting clarity around uh, a real great business plan and working that out and flushing it out and maybe bringing in a, a consultant or two who it does have expertise. And that's Kathy and I have invested a couple hundred thousand dollars in ourselves uh, just in everything from courses to masterminds to personal development and all that. We actually met in a personal development program. Oh, cool. So, short answer is I would invest that 10,000 into making myself better in education. So it's interesting. You met, you said you met her at a personal development program. I met my wife at Tony Robbins. I don't remember if I told you that. Oh, you did. Tell me. That's awesome. Yeah. Where did you meet your wife? What, what, uh, what a event? program called SciWorld. It's like a personal success Institute up in the Bay area. That's been around since like 1974. And yeah, it was a three month program where you set three professional goals and three personal goals. And you go through this 90 days and you have a coach you talk to every day, but they team you up with a buddy. And my buddy didn't show up for that opening thing of the person that I was supposed to be assigned to. So they're like, oh, Rich, we're going to put you with someone else. We're going to put you with this woman, uh, Kathy. And <laughs> what are the I instantly knew what one of my goals was going to be for the next three months. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. I like that. I like that. Well, cool. So what else, what other success principles can you share? Like what, you know, you've been around 17 years. Most businesses don't last for, for you know, more than a, a few years or so. Um, so what's kept you on the top? I mean, you're, you're one of the top podcasters. You're, you're one of the go-to people uh, in real estate. A lot of people know who you and your wife are. You guys are, you know, have a great team. Like what, what's kept you on top? What's kept you there and kept you, kept you going all these years? That's a, that's a good one. I mean, there's the, kind of the obvious answer in a way is our core values have been, you know, very important at Real Wealth. You know, we, we hire to our core values. We fire to our core values. We do reviews to our core values about uh, everything from accountability. We have a, a culture of accountability, uh, the integrity, of course, uh, connection, transparency. So those have helped a ton. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things is being an early adopter. So we're always looking at what's next and not just sitting and just sitting around saying, well, we've come up with a model that works and we're just gonna keep doing this. So we're always looking at where's the market headed, what's shifting, uh, you know, things have changed in the last 17 years we've run this business. So even in the beginning when Kathy's it would come home from a radio show with a, a CD of the show and all of a sudden I had an iPod back then, you know, in 2005, and they just came out with this thing. I got an e email from Apple saying new, new thing called podcast, Apple podcast you know, on iTunes. And so I looked into it and I took her CD from the radio station, converted it into an MP3 file, uploaded it to iTunes. And it was one of the first, if not the first real estate podcast on iTunes. Um, and because of being an early adopter, that, that just took our, our group of investors from a couple hundred people to thousands and thousands all over the world. So. Very nice. Just that type of thing. Always looking at how can we respond and what's next. Yeah. You said something, I was actually doing a training yesterday and we were talking about core values. Um, you know, for the, I always say first 10 years, first 10 years of my business was, was a lot of learning curves that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, I guess, struggles, if you will, until I started figuring things out and asking for help and that type of thing. So for the first 10 years, I didn't have core values in my business. I didn't have a culture. Um, so that, that to me, you know, finally adopting that about 10 years ago was super important. So, Big. you know, you kind of touched on a little bit core values, like core values are, what do you stand for? Right. It's like honesty, integrity. You mentioned accountability, uh, for us, it's teamwork. You know, if someone needs help, you know, step up and help them. Don't, awesome. you know, don't act like it's just, you know, you and, and your stuff that needs to get done. If someone needs help, you need to pick them up. We need to lift each other up instead of what happens in a lot of organizations where they compete with each other and kind of knock each other down. So um, I just wanted to mention that because you mentioned core values. So for anybody who's building an organization, that's super important. You got to have a list of things in your uh, organization that you want from somebody. And typically when you hire someone, 
you're going to hire them, like you said, on core values. And when they come into your organization, you're going to realize pretty quickly if you have those core values set, whether they're going to meet those or not. And once we implemented those core values, it's like our level of people just completely changed. You know, we attracted better people. Right. And then the people that came in, if they didn't adhere to those core values, they stuck, stuck, out, uh, stuck out like a sore thumb and they got out of our organization pretty quickly. So... It's amazing, yeah, and it creates that culture. And like I said, we have that one of our core values is accountability. You know, I, I do what I say I will do. You people can count on me and all that, and, and I'm willing to be held accountable. Um, that's just one of the core values. But what we've seen, we've been a remote company for over ten years now. We don't have a, a core office. We did mm. uh, for seven years up in the Bay Area. We had an uh, office with seven different offices and a main conference room and all that. And over time, we just decided, you know, let's let's move to remote again, being early adopters, and it's been phenomenal, you know, with all the technology and everything. And now, after you know, going to the, the whole thing, going through the the whole lockdown and COVID and everything, that was uh, wild. How many companies learned to become remote companies, and it was kind of cool because we were like, oh, you know, <laughs> we don't have to learn this; we got it. <laughs> it's really good, and that was because of our culture. We have inspired leaders. Each person's a leader in their own right and they take responsibility for their job. So we don't have to be looking over their shoulder, don't have to be checking in on them. They have their, their big, most important goals that they're focusing on and they're checking in on the results every week uh, and every month and every quarter. So yeah, it's, that's been great. Cool. So tell me, you said early adopter. So there are a lot of changes in real estate the last couple of years. You know, technology and education and all this stuff is way more accessible. There's a lot more competition in the market. Uh, for those that are investing full time, those that are passive, obviously, that's, that's a little bit of a different story. But, um, you know, I don't know how much you want to disclose, but what are some things you guys are working on that um, could be like an early adopter thing that other people could uh, potentially look at as the next thing to kind of look at? Oh, man, there's, there's so many that's going, going through my head right now. I mean, one of the big ones, um, I mean, one of the things we did was setting our real standards to REAL. It's like renovated, examined, appraised, and licensed um, for you know for how things go with these properties. So uh, we were seeing in the whole you know, turnkey business that a lot of companies were calling their properties turnkey, uh, and their standards were a lot different than someone else who would be calling their property turnkey. So investors were getting screwed because they're like, oh, it's a turnkey property and they buy it. And it was like, you had to do a lot more than turn a key uh, mm -hmm. to make it work. And it's like, it was crazy. So getting ahead of that, we brought all of our 15 different property teams from around the country together in one room and we offered them a free mastermind. Uh, and now we do this every six months with them. So we all get together is usually about 35, 40 people in the room. And we talk about best practices. So it was about getting ahead of that and saying, hey, in this industry, we're seeing companies calling their properties turnkey. What is a true turnkey property? And with all these experts from all over the country and their different markets sharing, and we all uh, boil it all down and said, okay, these, this is what really is a true turnkey or a real, we didn't even want to call it turnkey. It was such an abused word mm -hmm. that we called it real income properties and real to get up our certification. And now all of our property teams offer, you know, very similar type, you know, un under the same standards. And that's been huge. It's been, you know, that's why we're at 50,000 members at Real Wealth Network uh, over that. And uh, I think it's why so many investors you know, go through us for multiple properties. So I Super think that was a big one about getting, getting ahead of it and making change before we were hit with the change or being too slow to it. Right. Cool. So we're going to wrap this up. Any, uh, any other great insight you want to uh, share with our listeners? Oh, great insight. Mm. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure there. Um, you know, I, what I've seen more than anything, it's um, about with your team, whether that's just you and your integrator or your visionary or your partner, uh, or you have a, a large team, it could be, you know, 27 employees like us, or it could be, you know, a couple hundred employees, uh, I think the most important thing is clarity of vision, uh, where everyone is rowing their boat in the same direction. And that's what we found at Real Wealth. It's like when we got really, really clear on where are we going, where do we see this business in one year, three years, five years, and 10 years, and talk that out with everyone. Not just It's not just Kathy and me coming and saying, hey, this is the vision. 
it's getting all in the same room. I actually take our whole team on a visualization into the future where we get to see the business 10 years in the future. And then we come out of that visualization and we talk about it, we get it all up on the whiteboard and we boil it down and we create this crystal clear vision. So everyone is aligned and everyone's moving in the same direction instead of people trying to do it on their own or thinking that they're, they're moving towards something. But so, I mean, that's the big one. I think getting clarity of vision and not just doing it on your own, but doing it with the people you work with. Yeah, I always say there things usually happen twice. Things happen in your head and then they happen in real life. So you have to kind of take that time to, like you said, get clarity and visualize what you want in the future. In fact, a uh, real quick story about my wife. I don't know if I told you the full, full story, but Tony Robbins has you do this visualization exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's a four day event. There's, I think there were 8,000 people in the room. So day two, is it day two? No, day three of the seminar, we did a visualization exercise. And he's like, what do you want in your life? And what has been holding you back and all that stuff. And so I'm thinking, okay, I've given up on women. So like, I really want a woman in my life, right? And so he's like, you need to describe exactly how, you know, if you want a sports car, what does it smell like? How does it feel? Like you have to put you, like immerse yourself in that. So I just kept envisioning like this woman, she's got dark hair, she's athletic, she eats healthy like I do, she loves to travel. Sure as heck, next morning, she sits right next to me out of 8,000 people and <laughs> oh, bam, excellent. there it is, right? So yeah. uh, I like what you just shared. Visual visualization is awesome. It helps you to understand what you want and even understand what you don't want, right? Absolutely. So stuff. Yeah, for good sure. Stuff. It's huge. I mean, yeah, people can say, it, you know, it sounds hokey or whatever and stuff, but it's like it's until you do it or until you, you know, go into the future in your own mind, yeah, it's it's really, really powerful. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, like I said, Rich, you're one of the guys that I, I respect the most in this industry. I mean, you have 50,000 members been doing this 17 years. Obviously you're doing something right and treating people right. So I appreciate you coming on. I look forward to catching up with you again and uh, good luck to you and everything you've got going on. Awesome. Same to you. Thank you. All right. Talk soon. See you, man. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening. Now go to www.remcommunity.com to connect with today's guest see our high-level masterminds, and to get free resources. Don't forget to share this with a friend and leave us a five-star review. We'll see you on the next episode.